mention here. South Crofty is here, Will Jane is here, uh, Drakeland's up, up in there. Um, what I'm going to be talking about, it's not the main mineralization itself, but I'm talking about the elven dikes. Now, what is an elven? And if you look in the literature, no one's quite clear, but it's, a, I think, a, a quarryman's term for a building stone, but in this case, it's for dikes. You can have, also have blue elvens, which are completely different. Um, so the, what they are are rhyolite quartz felspar porphyry dikes, um, and they're generally granitic in composition, but the exception is they're very, very, generally very rich in potassium. So somehow they've got enriched in potassium. They cut the granites, except the very late fine-grained granites. So they're very closely related to the granites and the mineralization. And you'll see how in a, in a second. So what, what can we do that's new? Uh, we've had a, a major airborne geophysical survey in the area. So I'm going to show you some of the results of that, which have indicated uh, something about the composite nature of the granites and about the dikes. Uh, I've done some trace element geochemistry, some new, new trace element geochemistry, which I think is slightly better than the, uh, the, the, the last stuff. And I've also looked at the relationship with lamprophyre dikes in the area. Now, the lamprophyres are, have considerable importance because uh, they're obviously, we know they're sourced from, from the mantle, so their relationship to the granites might indicate how much mantle we've had input into melting and into the granites, and the relationship, obviously, to the elvens and the granites is critical, and I've shown some very new evidence on that. Uh, of course, I've got to do pay homage to uh, Sir uh, so Henry de la Biche, who's up, upstairs on the corridor uh, eating his lunch, and he did the, the, some of the great mapping in, in South West England, first released in 1839, and it, on his maps, in fact, are uh, the uh, elven dikes are quite prominently shown and also described in his memoir. And what do they look like? This is a, uh, a helicopter shot from uh, south of St. Austell. This is actually the Penchuan area. For those who know it, St. Austell is up in here, the Kalen. And you can see these dikes coming through. So they're actually quite difficult to find apart from on the coast. This one's been quarried for um, ch building, ch church building stone. And you can imagine if you cover that with grass, they're very, really quite hard to find. Uh, they're obviously very closely related to the mineralization. This is a section of South Crofty from Nick Le Batelier. And you can see here the mineralization, the veins, and the elvens following the same structures. And in this case, if you read the 4301 for South Crofty, they're actually capping the mineralization here. Okay, this is uh, granite, this is metasediment. So uh, very closely related in time. Some uh, mineralization we cut, some not cut. The, probably the better example is Wheel Jane. And when Wheel Jane was actually discovered, it was thought the mineralization was actually related to the uh, genetic related to the elven dikes. So on the footwall of the elven dikes, obviously cut by these later structures here, as they got down with depth, they found, in fact, that the mineralization was actually fed from below along this uh, south load structure, and it was, in fact, just constrained by the dikes. And, cut, and again, you can see these copper loads cutting through, cutting the dikes. So the dikes are obviously very early in, uh, in the, uh, just after the mineralization, but cut by the later mineralization. And if you look at this long section, uh, this is from the, the mine sections. I put this together. You can see, again, the feeder structures looking the other way. Here are the dikes feeding mineralization to the base of this structure and then cut by these. This is one of the later copper loads, hot load, for those of you who know it. Cuts the elven dikes and then cut by the uh, later cross-course dikes, which are a little bit later, about 34 million years later. OK, and if you're outcrop, some of you may know this, this outcrop. This is the uh, St Agnes section coming along from Chapel Porth again. This is what these dikes look like in outcrop. And again, the mineralization being constrained, probably rheologically, by, by the dike. Okay. And you can see tourmaline veinlets feeding up to the base of this dike and being uh, mined out here. So they're very closely related. So can we use these dikes to actually uh, sample them and get some idea of what the potential might be? Right. Uh, they also occur in other tin-bearing areas. Thanks. Uh, this is in Spain. This has not been recognized as what an elven dike, but it's a tin-bearing area in Spain. Very similar sort of dikes. So the same processes do occur elsewhere. 
Some of you from North America might be familiar with Mount Pleasant, where we've got very similar dikes with the tin deposits there. Okay, so looking at the general spatial distribution, this is what they look like. So this is the a map of southwest England with just all I put on here, the elven dikes, the lamprophires, and it, these are the Permian sediments which cover everything else. And hopefully you can see that they're mainly confined to this area down here, some of the elvens going north-south, but mainly, mainly mimicking the mineralization. Okay, not much up in here. The lamprophires mainly associated with the Permian and coming down through here. And the, the lamprophires form a shadow around the granite. Uh, this one down in here, I've got question mark Devonian. There are some, Devo some Devonian fell sites, but this one may be a composite of both Devonian and Permian age uh, dikes. If we then add on the Bouget outline of the granites, so the granites at depth, you can see that they can constrain the dikes very nicely, with this exception up in here, which we'll talk about a bit later, uh, which is probably a, some sort of a complex type, which we'll mention. And you can see the base it related to the granites at depth. And if you put on the granite outcrops, that's what you get um, in terms of the, uh, the elven dikes. OK, so um, in terms of ages, the granites have got um, two, mainly two, two, two ages. We've got the older granites up in here. This is uh, 290, uh, two, 270. Uh, Carmenellus, Bobman more older. Then we've got the younger St. Austell Land's End, uh, Dartmoor Dykes. We're going to have some more, uh, some up-to-date ages soon. You can see the Elvins being dated in two phases. Carmenellus is about 280, and the St. Austell one's at about 270. Uh, this is what the composite radiometric data look like. So you can see immediately the, the granites become composite, uh, the black areas or the peat areas. Uh, hopefully you can see the two different age granites appear. Uh, composite parts in Carmenellus. These are the younger ones, looking this pink, pink shade. Uh, they're lithium rich, uh, with, also with topaz. And you can start to see some of the other features. The lamprophires do appear. Hopefully you can just about, don't know if you can see that, there's a very bright green feature coming through. That's a lamprophire dike, so you can actually map them out from the, the airborne radiometrics. So green is uh, thorium, red is potassium, blue uranium. And you can really do a great deal with the, with the uh, airborne radiometrics. So if we come in and try and do a little more detail and try and map up the lamprophite, the uh, Elwyn Dykes, these are this is total count radiometrics. You see these features coming through here, which map out the dikes. That's the uh, lamprophire dike coming through here. Again, zooming in a bit more. We have very, very good LIDAR data, so we can actually map up the LIDAR, and these are the mapped um, elven dikes from the Geological Survey. If we then put uh, on the top of that the potassium channel, you can see you can immediately map out the elven dikes in terms of excess uh, potash. So we've now got a very good handle on these dikes, and we actually use them to try and sample things. And you'll see uh, a bit later that we used, we've picked up a, a very strange dike based on these radiometrics. Um, right, about geochemistry, I said we know the granites are very composite, and David Manning, in particular, has done a huge amount of work mapping the synostal granites, and you can see these are, these are very composite. So this is a biotite granite out here, the lithium granites in here with uh, tourmaline granites, and as you'll see in a moment, we can use immobile element geochemistry to try and differentiate these different granites. So why hasn't it done before? Uh, if you try to work on these elvens before, this is what the, they look like petrographically, so they're really messed up, very altered. There have been a number of people who tried to work on the elvens that I don't think they've got, they haven't really used trace element chemistry. They've used a lot of majors, and they haven't really tried to do, to do that. This study deals with XRF majors, 49 element trace, uh, ICP, e, ES, and MS. The only element I really don't have is any fluorine, which is a, probably a big omission. Um, this is a diagram from the Russian study, uh, quartz, albite, orthoclase, the granite spot in here, as you might expect, as crustal melts, the elvens plot out in here, so uh, they've got a lot more potassium. So they've seen some sort of potash-rich fluid. 
Um, this is David Manning's work, and he uses niobium zirconium to try and differentiate the different granites. And you can see that's achieved very well. The biotite granites, tourmaline granites, topaz granites. So the question is, can we do the same thing for the elvins? And in fact, we can do. And in the past, they've been said to be all biotite granites. But you can see clearly from this plot of my data that they're not, that some of the elvins are very clearly derived from the topaz granites. So um, the same process that's applied to the biotite granites also applies to some of the topaz granites as well. So the, the key, key's up in here, St. Orst, for those of you who know it, St. Orstal, the Perrin Porth area. Uh, there's a couple of elvins that look north-south. Helston, which mentioned up near Camelford at the moment, and the rest of it shown there as elvins. So it's a conium, niobium. We can get some idea of what, where these dikes were derived, what magma these dikes were derived from. Um, if we put, then plot out some of the data here, we plot out tin. Uh, hopefully you can see the plotting tin of the dikes I've got. Hopefully you can see that these dikes to the south and north are very rich in tin. This is something that's not been picked up before. They're also uh, very low in titanium, as the uh, lithium topaz uh, granites are known to be, and uh, the, the rest are not, generally not high in tin. So they're sort of about 20 to 50 ppm. Another interesting element, obviously, is lithium. And if you look at lithium, again, the Snorlstall granite's very rich in lithium, uh, the, the elvins down in this area, and also the area around Wheel Jane at Chasewater, also quite rich in lithium. And the same applies to cesium. So uh, some these dikes down in here associated to the south of St. very rich in cesium, as is um, the areas around Wheel Jane. Uh, looking at rare earth data, uh, generally they conform to what's been s suggested before, so they correlate very well with the uh, granites. These ones down here, the St. ones, which are generally quite unenriched in rare earths, with the exception of this dike up in here, which is very enriched in rare earths. And it, it's interesting, it's the one that's quite close to a lamprified dike, the only one that's quite close to a lamprified dike. So that in, uh, really thought, got me thinking, do we need to go and look at these relationship between the elven and the lamprified dikes? So I went into the literature, and there's only one previous unconfirmed report of a cross-cutting relationship of a lamprified and an elven. And if you look a bit further, you get this very nice quote. This is a, a, very, a very nice comment from a paper, uh, comment by Scrivener. But it must consider that Collins, who did write the paper, who unfortunately was sometimes vague and differentiating between the igneous rocks, may have been correct when he described a microtrap as being intercepted, uh, that that's a lamprophy intersected by a felspar porphyry. So he, he, he was even uh, able to forgive Collins. The, uh, Scrivener, by the way, was one of the people in Matt Malay Malaysia. Okay, so uh, when I, I read some of these things, we went and looked at this dike up in the north here, and hopefully you can see this is um, a total count plot of radiometrics. Hopefully you can see that dike is coming through here. Uh, the rest of the dike up in here is not enriched in total count. So uh, the Lamale lamprophyre, for those of you who know, the area is down in here. So the question is, why is this elven dike rich in total count radiometrics? Uh, okay. So we went out and had a look at the uh, dike. This is the Hellstone dike, which is not enriched. So very nice, white, typical elven, quartz porphyry. They went down to um, the St. Q area, and this is what the dike looked like about 100 years ago when the Geological Survey took the photograph. It's now full of rubbish and, and vegetation, but at least you can see, hopefully you can see here the dike is coming through. So they took samples for them, uh, from the dike and looked at them and also looked in here. And hopefully you can see in here the green rounded inclusions within the elven. And if you look at those, they look like they're lamprophyre inclusions within the elven. And if, oh, sorry, this doesn't show very well, but these are the inclusions of lamprophyric within the, uh, the quartz porphyry. So can we prove that the, this, this dike is a mixture of lamprophyre and uh, more felsic magma? If you look at the geochemistry, I think this is perhaps maybe convincing. Here, the, all the elvens is thorium, nickel, the nickel, obviously, for the lamp fires are somewhere up in here. These 
uh, values in here from the St. Q area, from this area we thought might be mixed. Hopefully you can s see it suggests that uh, this elven has seen some amplifier. And uh, again, looking at niobium zirconium, again, the, the same sort of thing. Not doesn't show a huge amount, but uh, uh, perhaps we've put more, more convincing the rare earths. Here's a plot of the lamprophires for rare earths. Uh, obviously, there's some sort of artifact in the leak data. Uh, there's the hailstone data, which is, looks like it's a topaz granite, come out of a topaz granite. And here are the, the areas we thought were mixed. So the, that dike look at is a mixture of elvins and um, lamprophire. So some conclusions. I think we've shown for, really for the first time that the elvins are related to different granite types. We've seen it before from ages. Uh, this same process that generates the elven dike. So presumably it's some sort of um, ion exchange, some enrichment of potassium with this, perhaps with a mineralizing fluid. It's been active over time. The tin is high in the lithium topaz rich elvins. I think the reason for that is there's no, absolutely no rutile. So um, if you've got a normally bi a bi the elvins from the biotite granite, I think the tin will probably go into rutile. If you don't have any titanium, then considerite will precipitate out. Um, and some of the mapped elvins have lamprophires along them. We don't know how many, uh, but mixing with this potassium rich material has obviously obscured the chemistry. So these elvins may, in fact, have a signature of mantle input, but will simply uh, have been obscured by this later, later felsic input. Thanks very much. <clears throat> well, what else apart from potassium was added if you plotted you know, it, the elvins? It seems to be just potassium. Just potassium? Yeah, that's, uh, not, not much else in terms of uh, trace elements. Really? So if you plotted elven uh, uh, divided by the associated granite, yeah, you, you the might only get thing that would be different would be potassium? You're, they're probably, they're probably going to have rubidium, some rubidium as well. Right. It's hard to conceive a fluid that only adds potassium. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Any more questions? Um, that's it.